Hi, this is Rick Crawford, the San Diego Public Library, and we're up on the ninth floor of the Central Library downtown. We're going to take you into special collections and give you a tour. So just follow us in. We're in the reading room of Special Collections. We have three different departments here. We have rare books, we have genealogy, and we have a California history collection. And when you come in, you're going to normally find a staff person here at this desk, and they'll answer your questions and get you started. There's also a lot of study areas on the perimeter of the floor, so if you want to just come up here and read, study, that's fine too. So let's walk through it. I'll just show you some of the, the highlights of all these collections. We have a big reference table here with computers. This is the only computer section on the floor or in the library where it's, it's reference only. We don't have internet for people. This is not where you come to do your Facebook and YouTube. We have databases here. We have uh, a library catalog, of course. We have two computers here that are very special because they're attached with microfilm readers. And this is what we use for reading microfilm. We have a big collection of microfilm, which you'll see shortly. And it is the reels microfilm are put on this machine here. You see your image on the monitor here. And from here, you can you can email the images, the, the articles you see. If it's from the newspaper, you can cut and paste an article, email it to yourself. It can be printed, download it to a thumb drive. So it makes it a lot, a lot easier. What we have on most of the floor is genealogy, and we have about 10,000 books out here. The public library has been collecting genealogy for decades, but before we moved to this library, we were given the entire collection of San Diego Genealogical Society, and that expanded the collection in a really big way. Most of these books uh, are, all of these books that you see here in the computer catalog. So if you're researching your family, you can type in the state, uh, and it would give you the section that this is in. It's arranged by Dewey Decimal, like as most public library arranges their books, which means basically you have a section for every state. And we have a cheat sheet that shows you Ohio is this call number, Alabama is that number, and so forth. And we can get people going when they come in here. If you're a new genealogy student, uh, we can get you started. Usually we put you on Ancestry.com, which is on our computers, and that's free. It has to be used at the library, unfortunately. You can't do it from home but we're happy to show you how to get going with that. And uh, a lot of material, people need to know that a lot of material is not digitized. You can't just go to the internet and do all your genealogy that way. That was a huge help, of course. A lot of the material is still in the books, and uh, we're happy to show you how to do that here. Let's walk back here, and I'll show you uh, our biggest reference table is right here. If we're busy, this may have several people in it working here, and uh, most of the California materials are back of house. They're behind the wall here, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, when you're looking for California history, you'll talk to us and tell us what you're after, and we'll kind of help you uh, guide your research that way, but we'll also pull the materials from the back that you need to see. This section right here is uh, probably used more than anything else. This is our city directories. We have city directories that go from the late 1880s all the way up to 1984. So we have about a century of these directories here. These are like phone books, but they're better than that because they will give you not just names of people and addresses, but it will tell you occupations, how many people lived in a house. And uh, they're just arranged here on the shelves chronologically so you can come in and help yourself to these. Most of these, uh, well, they're all arranged just alphabetically alphabetically by the name of the person or the company. It's also businesses as well. And it began in the 1880s. This volume, 1926, they started something very clever. They put in cross-references, which means if you don't know uh, the name of the family or business you're looking for, you can look it up by the name of the street, and it will give you the house number or business number, and that gets you going from there. Can we get a close-up of a page? I want to show you what these look like, and you'll see that it's quite a bit different than a phone book in the kind of information it gives you. It'll give you abbreviations for occupations. You might see 
a salesman, clerk, teacher, all kinds of information that, that may help you. These are really valuable for people that are researching their house or the history of a business. Sometimes people will come in and they're looking for a, a chain of title for their house and they can work through that using the city directories. Another, another tool like city directories are the Haynes Crisscross directories and these are books that have from 1974 on, they continue to go on today, and these are arranged numerically uh, by phone numbers. If you happen to have a phone number, it's going to be very difficult to read, but every phone number out there is going to be in here for San Diego County. And you just look it up and you can get the name attached to that phone number. And then within the book, most of the book, it's going to be alphabetical by street name and you'll look up your street name and it's going to give the house numbers below that and along with the house numbers you'll have the name of the people or business that live there. So all of this gets quite a bit of use here in the archives. Most of our California material is back here. We have a little bit of material out here for people. This is some of our most commonly used books. Uh, these are illustrated histories of San Diego that people like to look at. We have a complete set of the Journal of San Diego History here in blue. That's a very valuable source for San Diego history that's been around for many, many years. And let's walk in the back and I'll show you the back, back of house where you're not going to go as a patron, but you'll get a look at it today. Some of the tools, you'll see some of the tools that we have back here. This giant card catalog is actually an index to the San Diego Union. Many, many decades ago, the librarians in the California room at the Public Library began indexing the San Diego Union. The Union's been around since 1868. It's been published continuously since the fall of 1868 to the present. And their goal was to create a subject index, name and subject index to the whole collection. And it didn't get quite completed. We have a big gap between 1905 and 1930. But otherwise, they went through the whole paper and did this. And what they did was, uh, on catalog cards, they would put uh, a brief description of the article. And at the bottom, they're going to have the date of the newspaper and the page and column number. So people can come in and use this kind of collection, this kind of index, to tell them exactly where to go in the microfilm. This is not the newspaper itself, of course. It's an index. It guides you toward the subjects. Uh, many years ago, this entire collection was photographed and put onto microfiche. So if you're a patron coming into work, you're going to look at the microfiche version of, of this whole catalog. And we can show you that in just a minute. Here is uh, our microfilm collection. We have hundreds of reels of microfilm. We have the complete San Diego Union. 1868 to the present, the San Diego Evening Tribune, 1895 until it merged with the Union a few years ago. And many papers you don't know about that are still valuable for San Diego history. We have San Diego Sun, which went from the 1880s to the 1930s. We have uh, a complete run of the San Diego Herald, which was our 1850s newspaper, the first paper in San Diego, only the second newspaper in Southern California. The LA Times beat us by a few months. But we have all that available for you on microfilm. And you can look at it on the viewers that I showed you out in the front of our room. And let's, let's go around the corner here. Well, actually, let's go back. You can have a glimpse of our back of house storeroom. This is where we store all of our books. We have about 15,000 books, mostly San Diego and California history, uh, virtually all of that. It's on movable shelving. If these shelves were three feet apart, as normal shelving would be, we'd be way beyond our wall here. This is the only way we can get all of our books onto the footprint that we have up here. So the movable shelving gives us a whole lot of space. And these turn, as you can see, very easily with just one hand. So this is where we will retrieve the books for you when you come in to do your work. Let me show you uh, a few samples of fun things that I think are great for research. This is one 
very, very valuable research material for the 1880s. Everybody registered to vote, every male registered to vote, and these entries would be put in, into these big volumes. And these are handwritten, of course, in the 1880s. Uh, this particular volume gives us uh, the names alphabetically, roughly alphabetically, but it gives us a lot more than a name. It gives their age, what country they were from, their occupation, their local residence. This particular book even gives physical descriptions. This tells us their height. It tells us the color of their eyes. Do they have any visible scars? Very interesting. We didn't have photographs, of course. We didn't have ID cards. So this was the tool they used to identify voters. We have a good run of these from the 1880s on for 20 or 30 years. We have another great tool here that people like to look at. These are Sanborn fire insurance maps. And this will show you how the city grew for many years. And it's also useful for people that are researching the history of their house. This particular volume is, uh, was created in 1888, and then it would be updated with little paste-ons that go over the sheet. These books are created for fire insurance purposes. And this tells us something about the building, whether it's brick or wood, frame or whatever else it might be made of. Uh, the colors and numbers around it will give coding to tell us all that kind of detail. But it's really fun to look at these books and see how the city grew. Got a page marked here that shows uh, Horton Plaza, for example. This is Horton Plaza, very early 1900s, before, uh, well, this would have been before 1905. This is the Horton House Hotel. This is the site of San Diego, or the U.S. Grand Hotel today, on that same site. Here's the plaza. This would be where the late shopping center was. So, on this page I turn it over, and here's the San Diego Public Library on, on 8th and East Street, the, the location we just moved out of. This was the Carnegie Library that opened in 1905 and was torn down in 1952. We have a lot of oversized materials that is stored in flat files. We have architectural drawings and we have maps. We have about 800 maps in our map collection. They're all stored in these big oversized folders here. Most of our maps are encapsulated. This is an example of an encapsulated map. It's just uh, sandwiched in mylar, which makes it much easier to handle and keeps the material clean and easy to handle and, and safe. Offices. We have good views from up here, as you can see, up at the ninth floor. And let's walk down this way and out on the reading room. We've always got a lot of work going, so we've got rolls of drawings and maps that are going to be cataloged, a lot of ongoing work. I mentioned the index to the San Diego Union. This is our microfiche index. That big card file over there has all been distilled down to these microfiche slides. And we have a viewer here. You can put the slide in. We can actually show you a close up of what these look like. So this is actually just the card file that's been photographed, and you'll see in this case we have a man up here. Uh, this is an obituary, just a little brief information, and down here it's going to give the date in the newspaper. This is September 1948. 
page 12, column 5. So that gives you really specific information as to where to find this in the newspaper. This may be enough information for you, but if you want to look at the newspaper itself, you can go to the microfilm and we can find it for you very quickly with that information. And here we have a couple microfilm reader printers. These are very old. These have largely been replaced by the computer version that we have up front. But if you're just scrolling through the newspaper, this is a really fun way to look at the newspaper just by turning the pages because we've got good sized screens here. You can also print out pages. These are old fashioned coin operated machines, but they still work. It'll take three nickels to get a page that will spit out a laser print copy over there. there are lots of reading room space up here. As you can see, we have a lot of desks. These are all powered, so you can bring in your laptop, you can charge your phone. Again, great views of the city from up here. We're right along the trolley line. When we first moved here a few years ago, we had much better view out here. We've got skyscrapers taking over our skyline here. But this is all of our genealogy materials out here. You're looking at this section right here closest to us is our periodical section for genealogy. We've got scores of titles, hundreds of titles of genealogy periodicals here. And then as I said earlier, we have about 10,000 books on the floor. So we have a lot of information on genealogy uh, that you won't find on Ancestry or, or any computer site. Sometimes people will come in and they just want a really quick look at some San Diego subject. And clipping files sometimes help them with that. We have in these file cabinets, which you can help yourself to, we have all kinds of San Diego topics that are just arranged alphabetically. And we also have biography files. So if you have a San Diego name you want to look up, we'll have a clippings file maybe on that person. So these are files that people can help themselves to, all the cabinets here. And, uh, I should say, as a whole, though, the entire floor is reference only. Nothing gets circulated from this department. Everything is up here, doesn't get checked out. So you can be assured that the book you're looking for should be on the shelf, the file should be here. We have a lot of artwork on this floor, which we're very proud of. You see some of it up here. Uh, most of these are uh, plain air paintings, uh, the landscapes by San Diego artists. These are paintings that were donated to us, in most cases, many decades ago. Uh, Alfred Mitchell, uh, Charles Fries, many of these painters who were uh, known in their day, but they're much more popular today, years later. We have a lot of exhibit space on this floor, and these are displays that we have out here just outside of our rare book room. Matt and I, full-time librarian up here, did the exhibit displays we have out here. This is a wonderful display on Japanese book plates. Book plates are a big collection that we have here. Book plates are something that people put in their book to show their ownership, but they can be wonderful works of art as well. More artwork, and this is from the Wangenheim collection. This is a collection of, of children's art that's very interesting. These are two very nice displays that were put out by Matt and I. We have a lot of Donald Ward material here. Donald Ward was a San Diego artist and sculptor, uh, did wonderful work. You'll see a lot of civic art that he's done around San Diego. Uh, and that's kind of, there's examples of that here. This is an exhibit on, on Steinbeck. We have a complete collection of Steinbeck, and these are all signed first editions that were donated to us not long after we moved to our new building here. This is the Rare Book Room. This is the Herbie Family Rare Books Room. The Herbie Family, uh, which also donated to uh, our Point Loma Library, uh, donated a lot of money to make this a wonderful room. 
we'll have a look at a lot of the treasures of our collection here. If you visited the old library that we moved out of uh, six years ago uh, on 8th and E, we had the Wangenheim room up in the ninth floor. And this is the same collection, but it's presented much better here. We have a beautiful room here. It's sited very carefully to where we don't have direct sunlight. And uh, we also have protection for the windows so we don't get sunlight on the materials. But we have a reading room space here that's open most days, and we have a docent that will be here at this station right here. And this, the volunteer will sit here and describe the room, give tours for people, and uh, materials that people are going to do research with, we will pull from the back room here, which is on movable showing, and that's closed to the public, so we can retrieve materials back there. We have, in the reading room portion out here, we have maybe 10% of the entire collection talking about about 9,000 books altogether. Most of them are back behind the wall on, on shelving, but we have kind of our greatest hits out here and a lot of fun things to look at. Let me show you a few of the items in the display cases and we'll walk around and I'll show you that. Uh, these are rare dictionaries actually. Samuel Johnson gave us the first per important English dictionary in the 1700s. There's a picture of Samuel there. This is the first edition Samuel Johnson Dictionary, which is very valuable. We also have a nice set of James Boswell's biography of Samuel Johnson. Boswell's biography is a very famous biography of, of an important man. And this is the first edition of Noah Webster, which is the first American dictionary from the 1820s. around here, let me show you a couple examples of important works in our collection. Uh, one collection we're very proud of is our, fair, our Four Edge Books collection. A Four Edge book is a book that has a hidden painting on it, and we have about 200 of these books in our collection. Most people have never seen a Four Edge book, and I'm going to show you one now, if I can get my glove on here. This is a, a, a book of Don Quixote, very nice binding, but there's a painting underneath this part of the book. This is called the foredge of the book. And if I open up the book and I leaf it open in a certain way, it's going to show the painting. And this particular book is actually a double foredge. If I turn it over, I can get a different picture. This is a watercolor. This is done by the artist with a very dry brush. And after the painting is done, will actually have gold leaf over the edge that actually obscures the painting entirely. This is a book that kind of found the first library of San Diego. The nucleus of that library was books by Alonzo Horton, who founded Modern San Diego. And this is his own personal catalog of his collection of books. We have about 700 book titles here. This is, we're talking 1770. Uh, 1870s here. Our first library, public library, began in 1882, and many of these books were in that first collection. This is maybe my favorite item in the entire collection. This is a Bible from about 1220. This is very, very old. And this is actually a manuscript. It was never published. This is hand done on animal skin. And you can see the incredibly fine handwritten type in here. I don't know if I want to even call it type. It's just all handwritten, unbelievable. Uh, books at this particular time were not bound as they are today. The binding is later. The binding's about 1700s. But the book itself, this is a Bible in Latin. It has a little bit of illumination and decorations on the sides on the, and the margins. It's a very precious item. This room has a working card catalog, and that's, this is a kind of a feature of the room. All of our books, they're in the computer catalog, so you can look it up online. But we use the catalog because we don't want to put a 
Dewey Decimal Number on the spine of a rare book. So what we do is we use the catalog cards to give us our locations. So if you come in here, you're free to look at the catalog. You'll find on the cards handwritten uh, a shelf, a range and shelf number just in pencil in one corner. So this is going to be 33-4. That tells us range 33 in the back on shelf 4 will find this book. So we need this catalog to actually retrieve books, but it's a catalog that people can look at and browse. Let me tell you a little bit about the room itself. The wood you see throughout the room, the floor, the shelves, it's not actually wood. This is, this is coconut palm, which is considered a grass. It's not even wood. And it's very special. This is all veneer, uh, but it's a very heavy wood. And it makes wonderful furniture. It's difficult to work with, I'm told, but it makes beautiful shelving. We have two rare Persian carpets in the room. These carpets are over 100 years old. These were donated to us in the 1960s, along with a big collection of rare books. And these rugs, uh, we pick them up every five years or so to be cleaned and mended if they need it. Uh, but they are extremely durable. That's one reason why these are very valuable, is because they're extremely well made and they should last a very long time if they're cared for properly. This table here is a eucalyptus tree from La Jolla. And shortly before we moved, just about a year before we moved, this tree was cut down in the La Jolla area. I'm told it was a diseased tree and needed to come down anyway. But the woodworker was assigned the job of making a table out of this. So he, he cut the tree, top to bottom, and made these two long slabs. More wood was used for the base. And eucalyptus wood was uh, allowed to season for about a year before I began working on it. But what's interesting about the table is, because it's eucalyptus, if you know anything about this tree, they're everywhere in San Diego. They're not typically used for furniture because the wood is, has a lot of oil and it's pretty active. It'll actually change its shape for a few years until it fully dries out, which takes a very long time. Uh, so occasionally the woodworker will come in and he'll make adjustments to the position of the, of the table because it, it does move you know, a little bit at a time. You can see how much display case we have in the room. So we change these exhibits periodically. You can see here one of our most uh, requested collection. This is a complete collection of Edward Curtis photographs. Edward Curtis was a photographer from Seattle who produced over a course of many, many years a work called North American Indian. And his goal was to record in photography all the Native American tribes west of the Mississippi and all, all the way up into Alaska. And so he produced eventually 20 volumes, which are here, 20 volumes of text and photographs and 20 portfolio volumes. And the portfolios are all over here. Uh, I have one portfolio out, which we can see up close. If you've never heard of Edward Curtis, you've still probably seen his photographs because his pictures have been used over many, many years. Uh, if you see a picture of Chief Joseph or Geronimo, you're most likely looking at an Edward Curtis picture. And this collection is very valuable, very precious, because for many years these collections were broken up and sold by, by dealers. A particular portrait or a particular volume might be extremely valuable by itself, and so the big volumes were, were broken up. We don't know how many exist, but we have a numbered set. This is set number 285. We think that there were about 400 volumes made entirely, but nobody knows how many survive today. A few more interesting collections to show you. We have a collection of Babylonian clay tablets. These were collected by Julius Wangenheim. And I should back up and tell you the nucleus of the entire room is a personal collection of Julius Wangenheim, who was a San Diego pioneer businessman, uh, wealthy, 
collected a lot of things and he contributed, he donated his little personal library to us, uh, or his widow did actually in the 1940s. And that became the Wanganut Netbury. And that is most of the collection we have here in our rear book room today. But the, the, wing, the uh, clay tablets that he had here, he bought, we believe, in early 1900s. And we actually have translations for these. You'll see they're, they're numbered. And we have books here that will give you more information on each numbered tablet, uh, including the translations of these tablets. Most of these tablets were uh, business documents, the receipts, how much barley, how much wine, rain, ale, whatever. And uh, because it's made out of a material that lasts indefinitely, it's, we have these wonderful tablets. We have a big collection of miniature books. And when we have fourth graders in the room, this is the first place that they'll go. A miniature book is something that's three inches or smaller, and some of them are, are quite a bit smaller. We have about 400 of these in our collection, and so just a sample of them right now. There is one book over here, I don't know if we can get this very close, but this is considered the smallest book in the world. It's actually, at one time, it was the smallest, I should emphasize, the smallest published book in the world. Uh, this is a book that we purchased in the library about 20 years ago. And there are other copies about, they're very valuable today, but it's a book that you can only see in this case, and it's below a magnifying glass just to see it. And it's a little alphabet book. So it is not very readable without a microscope, but it's interesting to see. We also have items we call artist books, and this is where a book artist will produce a small book using maybe different material or just incredibly different designs. These are mostly works by an artist named Jill Tim, who works out of the Northwest and uh, she visits us on occasion and tells us, shows us what she's got. Just wonderful materials. That, uh, and she'll produce three or four of each of these items. And uh, we have a nice collection of those. And this case here is just uh, some examples of our some of our most precious items. We have a book of hours up here. We have uh, prayers and hours over here. These are books uh, that were in the infancy of printing. These were actually printed, but you'll see the artwork, the, the illumination around. Uh, for many years, uh, when we began printing in the late 1400s, uh, books would be printed, but the illustrations would still be done by hand. So this is kind of that period of time, 1400s. Uh, the Gutenberg Bible that really launched printing, at least in the West, uh, movable metal type of Johann Gutenberg, that was in the mid 1400s, and that's when printing began. And we don't have a Gutenberg in our collection. We have a beautiful facsimile, which we get out on occasion. It's a very important work. And uh, we have a lot of examples of materials uh, printing that came shortly after that. There's some beautiful Asian art over here. Uh, these have been, this is from uh, Hiroshigi. This is a famous work that he did called the 50, 53 Stages of the Tokaido Road. And this was a long road in Japan. And uh, we actually have a map of Tokaido Road over here. And for each station stop, he had an illustration for it. And we have the complete set of these, but Three of them have been nicely preserved and framed for display. And I'll show you one last item here in the room. This is a facsimile, facsimile of the Rosetta Stone, which was gifted to the library many years ago. And this is something that school kids love to see. The exact actual Rosetta Stone in the British Museum is much larger. And of course, it's a big stone. We have some history right here that you can read of the actual Rosetta Stone. But this is a good teaching tool because this is how we learn the Egyptian language because we have it, we have it in Greek and we also have it in two versions of the Egyptian. We have hieroglyphic and, and demonic. So we have three versions and we were able to translate the language because we had the Greek down here which repeated what was set up here. And that's how we learned how to 
sorry for that particular language. Up there with our, our tour of special collections. Unfortunately, we're closed because of the virus, as we're all suffering through right now. When we do open, be sure to come and visit us. We have a full staff up here that can guide you and show you. We have volunteers in this room to show you this particular room. And we hope, hope to see you. Thank you.